Oh, um, let's get going. Um, all right, today I'm so excited uh, to bring two of my good friends um, to the presentation. They are the co-founders of the Galbatross Project. Um, they are going to be talking today about female boreal bird identification. Uh, we have a uh, senior editor at Popular Science, Prabita Saha. Hello, Prabita. And senior network content editor at the National Audubon Society, Martha Harbison. Hello, Martha. Hello. Welcome and take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us from across the country or across the country, continent or across the world, wherever. Um, we're very lucky to be at this festival. I admit I have not been to Rangeley, but just studying the birds that are in the locality um, and that breed up there, I we were just talking before the presentation that we need to head up there that next summer and especially look for those big nails or listen for them. Uh, so my name is Perbita, um, and you all are uh, the second audience to um, go through the female bird ID class with us. Uh, but tonight is going to be very special because we are focusing on boreal birds um, and the wealth of breeding species that uh, Nick and David already mentioned um, in, in Rangeley and the boreal forest. Uh, so very quickly, um, uh, my name is Perbita, um, and Martha and I and um, our colleague Stephanie, we uh, founded the Galbatross Project, which um, pretty much came out of our own birding curiosity and fascination and um, frustration that there's this underappreciation for female birds out there. Um, you look at a field guide, I have the Sibley guide, which is beautiful, but there's very little identification information when it comes to the female type of a species. Um, and the same goes for ornithological study, um, photography, lots of fields of uh, birding and bird science. Um, so we started to just focus on identifying and understanding female birds in our own practice. And um, just in the past year or two have tried to make it more of a um, crowdsourcing and community science effort. Um, and now we are able to talk to um, very enthusiastic birders and bird lovers like you um, across, across the country. So excited to be here. Sorry about that. I'm still learning how to like advance my slides. Um, so yeah, thank you. And thank you for being here for that in, uh, introduction. Um, I think the one thing that I'd like to, some of the basics that I'd sort of like to set the tone for this uh, particular presentation and sort of when we talk about female birds, um, it's really, I would like to stress a couple of things and some of the ways that we in the Galbatross project um, sort of approach the female female bird identification is that first up, it's not a competition. Like so much about birding can feel like it's like, well, have you seen that yet? Or why didn't you, you know, oh, you got that, you got that ID wrong. Uh, doing female bird ID is is actually quite difficult um, there. And we're gonna go through some of the ways in which it can be difficult and ways that you can navigate around that. But I think like the first thing to understand is that you're, it's harder. Um, you need to learn a lot more about birds in order to do this um, well um, and be successful at it. And it's okay. I, I, I always, whenever I have to lead a bird event, I always tell people it's okay to suck at this. Um, it's more important to have fun. Um, and yeah, so one of the things that's really important um, is to sort of reevaluate the way that you go birding. A lot of us, especially when we're when we're starting out, and I see this when I'm leading uh, neophyte birders. Um, they try and I, they try and memorize everything, and there is a lot of that. Like when you're trying to learn to identify species, you're like, I need this field mark, this field mark, and this field mark, and maybe this vocalization. And you do this like, you know, it's basically a decision tree. Um, when it comes to female bird ID, what we found, or what I found personally, I should say, is that like I can identify the the species quite well. Um, 
but I'm looking at behaviors. And a lot of times like that, I'm not going to have that memorized, or I didn't even think that that might be a sex specific behavior. And so I will note it down um, either mentally or in my phone or whatever. And then I will go back and do research later. Um, and so a lot of female bird ID is actually about being very present in the moment when you're birding and noticing a lot of sort of the holistic uh the, the holistic bird, not just what it's what it looks like, but what it's doing, where what type of habitat is, is it exploiting? Is it doing so, what's its behaviors? Um, and then going back and looking to see what the literature says, then you can take that back out into the field later. So we've, I've personally found that it's much better to observe it first and then look it up as opposed to try and memorize a bunch of stuff and then go out and find uh, female birds. Um, uh, and it's like we've been talking about, you know, uh, boreal species. And so one of the things that we did is we tried to go through a lot of the a lot of the stuff that we do in this in this talk is looking at types or, or classes of things, the classes of things to notice. Um, but we went through and we tried to find as many boreal examples as possible because this is this type of the, the methodology that we use is is applicable across the United States and across uh, you know, I would say the ABA uh, for sure. Um, things get a little more complicated once you actually get into the tropics. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, since it's a boreal bird ID sort of discussion, we decided to focus more on, on, on what we can find in the boreal forest. Yeah, so I really wanted to quickly um, give a shout out to the spruce grouse, which I've never seen one of these beautiful birds. Um, hopefully many of you have. Uh, but our classic view of the spruce grouse is the bird on the left, um, this very bold red eyebrow or superciliary, uh, which the male carries around. Um, and, you know, that's fair. It's, it's very striking. But check out the female on the right. Like she has this beautiful barring on her chest, all this brown variation, the orange coming in, her back and tail are very different. Um, and sometimes they also, I believe, have a hint of red in the superciliary. But what's even cooler is that there are several um, types and subspecies of spruce grouse uh, across the northern U.S., across um, Canada and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and a lot of them are differentiated because the females have so much variation um, in their in their feathers and their behavior. Um, so I thought it was great to look at this remarkable species where the females, um, who we typically don't think of as remarkable, um, they're really kind of uh, the epitome of that. Um, but to be clear, like a lot of the examples we pull out today, they are birds that there are ways for us as humans to be able to differentiate them as male, female. But there are some birds out there that you just can't do it. I mean, you have to leave it up to the birds themselves. So it's not it's not like every bird on this planet is going to be identifiable as male, female based on our perspectives. Yeah. And that's OK. That's one of the things It's like you have to be really OK with amb ambiguity and not even just ambiguity. Sometimes you're like, yeah, we're just never going to know. Uh, um, they're actually, uh, I've, I found earlier this year that sandhill cranes are one of them. Apparently you can't even like, so like, even if you look at the cloaca, you can't tell. So it's like, okay, I guess we're just gonna let them have their secrets. Um, uh, whoops, I jumped forward. Uh, all right, well, uh, we're gonna hop into ways I would, I thought that there was a, oh, there it is. I actually hopped over a slide, I apologize. So it's like, one of the questions is why do we look at female birds? It's not just because it's fun, although it's really fun. Like I said, you can really learn a ton and really take your birding to the next level uh, when you start, when you commit to, to looking for female birds. Like all of a sudden you gain a ton of different skill sets that maybe had, been neglected before. Uh, so I highly recommend maybe at least giving it a try for, you know, the summertime or for the next migration, uh, not fall migration, fall migration's a mess, uh, but maybe next spring migration. Um, 
but there are like actually very important scientific reasons why we need to care about female birds um, and conservation. And it turns out when you actually study female, if you study both male and female birds separately, uh, this, uh, people have found that among other things, uh, the different sexes will use habitats differently. Um, one of the classic studies is with the golden wing warblers. And as it turns out, like, yes, they, you know, there's like their very specific breeding ha habitat in the, uh, you know, uh, the American Northeast. But when they go to Central America uh, for the winter, the males and the females actually use totally different habitats down there. Um, they, it, they actually separate based on elevation in the mountains. Um, and so if you care about full life cycle conservation um, and you're building uh, you know, habitat land management plans uh, down in Central America, you, have, you can't just like track where the males go uh, because you won't actually be conserving that species. You need to know where they both go and then protect both habitats. Um, and uh, there have been a number of studies that have come out in the last few years that have really looked at the male bias um, in a lot of the migration studies. And it turns out there's actually a huge knowledge gap in how uh, female birds, uh, how they migrate through, uh, through space and where they go uh, in the winter. So that's actually something that scientists are now trying to fill in. All right, so now we are going to move on to <laughs> the female ID. Uh, as you can see on the right, there are a lot of different options uh, for this. And we're going to go through and give you some examples for each. Um, but it's not just about plumage. Like plumage is actually like plumage is great. Feathers are awesome. But there's way more to female bird ID than just looking at um, and even just sexual dimorphism than just the color of their feathers or the pattern. So we break it down into three different areas. There are the obvious ones. Uh, the wood duck would be one of those, um, where it's like the males and the females are very different. Um, Northern Cardinal would be another classic example of this. Um, then there we call patches of difference. This is where you need to sort of notice, uh, you know, when a bird is slightly different. You're like, oh yeah, there, there, there's a female right there. And then there are the subtle ones. They actually have to pay really close attention because maybe it's a very, it's only a very subtle difference between the males and females. I'm just gonna hop right in and just do, here's an obvious one that's a boreal, that's one of the boreal birds that I love when I uh, go up to the Adirondacks. Although it, if we did have an eruption year, so we had them hanging out in Brooklyn uh, this, this past winter, uh, red crossbills. Um, you can see very much the, the female, all, all of these slides, uh, males are on the left, females are on the right. Um, you can see that there's a very clear plumage difference between the two. Now we're going to move into patches of difference. Prabhi, do you want to take this or you want me to take it? Uh, I think you could take this one. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I think your I think your slides jumped forward a little bit. Oh Hopefully. no! Oh wow! Yeah, sorry about that. So sorry. First, <laughs> patches of difference. Uh, Northern flicker. Um, obviously, we're looking at the at the yellow shafted. So that's the eastern uh, sub. Uh, not even really subspecies. The the eastern. Uh, type of flicker. And you can see that, um, you know, the males, they have the black malar stripe mustache, as I usually tell people um, that don't want to hear terms like malar stripe. <laughs> um, <laughs> female on the right does not have that. Um, that's one way that it's like, and so there are, there are different, th you know, different things you can look at, but that's like, okay, great. We have a malar stripe. The second one, which like usually blows people's minds because everyone has in their head that kestrels are just there. There is the classic kestrel look, but uh, but American kestrels are actually dimorphic or, or uh, physically dimorphic. And um, the way that you can tell the difference between those is that the females have an all uh, have a barred back um, and they don't have any of that steel gray on their wings. So it's like even from really far away, you can tell um, whether you're looking at a male or a female, like obviously we're, we're, we're talking about adults here, um, but just based on whether or not you can see that little patch of blue on the, on the wing area. 
And then the last one, this is another uh, boreal specialist, um, the blackback woodpecker. Um, again, the uh, male has the yellow little patch on the top of its head and female has a black patch. Um, now we're gonna get into the subtle ones. Yeah, so we're, we're going from easiest to a little more challenging. Uh, so when it comes to warblers, um, I don't know about you all, but I am seeing yellow warblers up the wazoo, uh, also hearing them. So often you hear the males before you see them. But if you do catch that very bright flash of yellow uh, and you get a good look at the chest, that is the most helpful feature um, for sexing these birds. So the males, um, the adult males should have like a pretty... Sometimes in the field, it looks like a pretty bright red uh, streaking down the chest. And as you can see, the female on the right, she's uh, really clean on the chest. Um, in the fall, they'll, the females will be more dull and olive than um, yellow. Uh, but you do also in the fall have to worry about juvenile birds. Um, but let's pretend that it's gonna be summer forever. <laughs> yeah, we should like stress that a lot of times when you're looking uh, when you're looking at sexual dimorphism, um, springtime is easier, although we'll get into some tricks on that, um, but that a lot of this, especially when it comes to um, uh, birds where juvenile males have the same plumage as females, like none of these rules sort of really, a lot of these rules don't work in fall is what it comes down to, uh, but you also have to be careful in spring. This is one of my favorites. Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, and again, I don't typically have access to bohemian waxwings down here in New Jersey, but I can practice this rule on cedar waxwings. Um, it works for both of the species. Um, and many of you might know the just to tell cedar waxwings from bohemian waxwings, um, you can see here the bohemians, they are uh, super gray um, down the front, and then they have that uh, like reddish, rosy, like makeup look on their face, which is really pretty. Um, but you can also really hone your focus um, and check out that uh, the black on the chin um, in the male, which is on the left, uh, the, the black will be a lot more extensive. I like to think of it as a neck beard. Um, and in a female, it's going to be, it's, it's still going to be dark and um, right under the bill, but it won't spread out as much um, under her chin. Uh, so I think of it um, as more of like a soul patch. Uh, the other tip is um, on the secondaries, which are uh, the wings that, um, or the wing feathers um, that you usually see when a bird is uh, perched. Um, those will on the male they will have like a lot more of that yellow waxy look um, as opposed to the female um so yeah those are your two big sexing tips for this really beautiful bird and again you can try those with cedar wax wings as well i have used that uh i actually have used that successfully in the field with cedar wax wings um so it's this is actually one of those field marks that's hard to capture on camera because of shadowing and this, that, whatever. But if you actually sit at with a uh, uh, with a with a flock of wax wings and you just start looking at their chins, you actually do start to notice uh, that there is a difference between the two birds. You can actually separate them out into two different uh, populations. Let's see if this. Uh, nope. There we go. Perfect. Okay. And then, um, so as Martha kind of teased before, uh, sometimes you're going to have a really tough um, sexual ID challenge when you're looking at a younger bird versus a female, um, and especially young males, uh, because they're uh, they'll be in that non-breeding plumage, so they won't look like your typical male from a field guide again. Um, so one of my favorites is the ruby-throated hummingbird, uh, blessed to be um, the only hummingbird on the East Coast, although we are seeing more uh, Western hummingbirds come over here now. Uh, so on the left, um, 
at quick glance, you might think that this is a female ruby throated uh, simply because it doesn't have that red ruby throat or the gorget, which are the shiny feathers um, under the chin. But this is actually a um, juvenile male. And the way you can tell is uh, it has those like cinnamon um, kind of brownish feathers on the flanks. Um, that's kind of going to be, again, it helps if you have the right perspective, but that's going to be your best bet for telling a juvenile male from the female, which is on the right. Um, the other good tip is if you get a view of the uh, tail feathers like we do on the right, um, the tail feathers on the female are going to look super fresh because she is in that full plumage. Um, so as you can see, like they're sharp, uh, the, they're perfectly rounded on the edge and there's like crisp white lines on the male, on the young male, it's going to be like pretty raggedy because they're eventually going to swap those tail feathers out. Um, so this is if you want to get like really nitty gritty and, um, you know, really have fun with uh, uh, sexing birds, but um, it's, you know, you, you should be seeing hummingbirds around right now, especially at feeders, so it's one to challenge yourself on. Uh, and one more uh, very, very detailed one um, that I know Martha really likes this challenge. Uh, so American red starts. Again, the female is very different from the adult male. Um, as you might know, the adult males are black and they have like these bright orange like warning signs on their wings and their tails. Uh, the female is um, pretty clean looking, uh, but she has yellow on the tail and yellow in her armpits, um, as does the young male uh, or the juvenile male, which is on the left. Uh, so the tip we use here is really looking for random um, odd black feathers, uh, whether it be on the sides of the bird or on the face. And if you do see that like tiny detail, that black feather, then that will, that should clue you in that it's a um, young male, not a female. Yeah, one thing that my colleague, one of my colleagues who's a bird bander actually pointed out to me uh, in the photo on the left, which was just taken last month um, in Central Park, is that you, if you look at the primaries, that's like the edge of the wing, um, so the end, basically the end of the wing that's sort of pointing out over the back there. You can see how rough it looks. It's because this bird's been wearing those feathers since last summer. Um, so this young male is going to, and you can see on its face where it's starting to, to, um, to molt uh, and show the adult male uh, black feathers. Uh, eventually this bird is going to lose these really old raggedy primaries and have nice clean feathers by the end of uh, the next molt cycle, um, which is something that I hadn't noticed when I first saw this photo. I just saw the black dots. Um, but then, yeah, my colleague was like, oh yeah, look at the primaries. They look rough. Um, I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Judging birds all the time. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we're moving on from feathers. Um, we're going to talk about size real quick, uh, especially with one group of birds, which are the raptors. Um, often raptors don't show a lot of differentiation in plumage between female and male. Uh, so the trick there is size. Um, and it's not true for every single raptor. But many of the common ones, um, the females are a lot bigger. Um, and there are a couple different theories behind why this might be. Um, most of them link to, you know, it helps her um, keep her offspring alive better. But um, yeah, what we know is that at least uh, with red tailed hawks, there's a pretty big differentiation. Um, and this is a lucky photo because we get to see the female under the male. Um, the females can be up to 20% bigger, um, which is handy for us. And then bald eagles, um, also similar. So in this photo, the, ball, the female is on the right um, and she can be up to 25% bigger. So again, this tip is really only helpful if you're looking at, um, you know, a pair or uh, a mother with, 
you know, a male offspring, uh, you really need that um, side by side comparison, almost kind of like, you know, trying to ID greater and lesser yellow legs, you need to see them next to each other to get that size, that size sampling. So plumage and size are, are two of the things that uh, th that a lot of birders are pretty familiar with, like, you know, using to differentiate males and females. But there are a lot of other ones that you're just like, wow, I didn't know that was actually a thing. Um, first, it was like, you know, wow, you can actually sex uh, European starlings. Now, this only works during the breeding season. Uh, but if you get really close to European starlings and you look at the base of the bill, uh females have a pink you can see that pink wash uh sorry the females actually on the left hand this side this time but anyway so you can see the pink wash that's right at the base of of the bill of that bird the males are sort of grayish green um it can be hard to find uh so you're going to need to look at a at a group of them uh, as they're usually strutting around on the ground but you know whatever i've got a zillion of those in new york city so i can like i've actually gotten very good at finding female starlings uh when i've been out at like prospect park um, uh, but it's actually one that's quite satisfying. Um, cause you're like, oh yeah, that, look at that. They weren't lying. Um, so yeah, that's when I actually suggest that maybe you try and find, uh, this year, if you happen to be around an area where there are starlings. Bill size is a second one. Um, and actually a surprising number of birds, uh, have a bill size, um, dimorphism. Most of them you'll find it in pile, which is sort of the Bible for bird banders. Um, and you need calipers in order to actually find it um, because there'll be like a millimeter or less um, in size difference, but it is there and statistically significant. But there are certain species uh, where you can actually see them uh, with the eye. And one of them, um, this is actually a tip I got from my friend Alvaro, um, is that uh, uh, marbled godwits, um, the females you can see in this photo the females on the bottom so she's a little bit chunkier uh, but she's got a much larger and heavier bill um and then uh the one up on the right from the female is a male the one that's on the upper left i think is a little too far away and angled wrong so i would not feel comfortable being able to actually sex that bird but the one on the bottom for sure um other birds that actually show this um that aren't uh that don't show up uh in the, in in the boreal uh are uh brown pelicans and the brown pelican bills are very obviously different the males have a much much longer bill than females And this is one of my favorites because it surprised the hell out of me uh, when I first learned it. Um, and this is only applicable to oyster catchers in uh, the Western Hemisphere, at least as far as I know. Um, but you know how you look at a, if you've seen an oyster catcher and you look at its eye and you're like, wow, that thing's got a weird goat eye or a cat eye because it's got this like it, this it's basically its pupil looks really weird. Um, those are called eye flex and they're basically excess um, pigment. So it's not that the, they're, they have a normal pupil like, like everybody that's round, uh, but these dark or black flecks on the iris uh, will make it look like the pupils are misshapen. Uh, and genetic analysis has shown that this is a sex link trait and that you can basically tell more than 90, with not more than 93% confidence in both the black and American oyster catcher, eye flex mean female. Um, and the larger the eye fleck or the more pronounced or the more of them that there are, the higher confidence that you have that it's a female. Um, nobody knows why this is, uh, but scientists basically went out, looked at a bunch of oyster catchers and looked at their eyes and also took, um, uh, took some uh, blood from them and, and ran the analysis. And it's like, it, it's there, which is like kind of weird. Um, I just want to show you just so you can get a really good look at that eye fleck on the lower right um, of the eye. And this is something that Prabita and I have used in the field to find uh, to find female oyster catchers. It's quite satisfying. So if you are in an area where oyster catchers hang out, like, and especially if you got a spotting scope, take a look at those eyeballs. Now we're going to get into the really cool stuff, which is behavior. Yeah, this is really fun because it makes you slow down while you're birding and really take stock of what a bird is doing, how it's interacting with other birds um, and interacting with its habitat. 
Uh, so going to start with migration timing, which is a little less relevant right now, but will definitely help you in early spring and also in fall. Um, so as you'd expect, most of for mo for many species um, that breed up here in uh, the U.S. Uh, the males are going to start moving up first, um, the, the adult males, I should say, uh, just so that they can scope out the territory, they can, um, you know, uh, get get the upper ground before the females, um, before the females arrive. Uh, not, not so with Wilson's and red phalaropes, and um, these two species, they flip a lot of sexual norms. Um, the females actually uh, mate with multiple males. Um, the the males do all of the nest and chick care. It's it's pretty wild, um, and pe pe birders love talking about them and studying them. Um, but uh, when it comes to migration timing, it's similar. Uh, the female Wilson's phalarope um, they they breed out in western lakes, um, and they'll get up here by or they'll get up there by mid-June and the males will arrive a full two weeks later. Um, same for the red phalaropes, with, which breed up in the Arctic. Um, yeah, and once the females get up there, they do the bulk of the work. They defend the territory, they court the male, they lay the eggs. But then as soon as all that's over, they're gone. They're gone by July um, and the males stick around. And like I said, do do all the upkeep with the family. Um, but, uh, what's gonna, going to be more helpful for you is, um, knowing which birds, uh, follow the typical trend, which again is the males coming up first. Um, so a lot of warblers follow that. Um, I'm sure up in the boreal, uh, the, the black pole warblers are very famous, um, for their long journeys. And again, the males will arrive first. Um, but uh, the one I wanted to focus on was the ruby crown kinglet, um, which is a which is dimorphic based on its feathers. Um, the name of the species is kind of hues to the male description um, because they have that ruby crown that they flare. Um, the females do not have that, uh, but otherwise they're very identical to look at. Um, but the males migrate a lot earlier in spring, um, and then in the fall, it kind of flips. So the young birds um, that were born this summer, they will leave first, then the females will go, and then finally the males. Um, so if you're seeing ruby crown kinglets, like, I don't know, maybe in October or even later than that, then it's... Um, it's a pretty strong guess that they are males. Another thing you can look at is pair feeding, um, both with the blue jays and the cedar waxwings. And this is really important um, because both those species will actually uh, pass food back and forth to each other, but the male is the one that, in, that in, initiates every time. So if you see an, an initiation and you see the first bird pass to the second, the second bird is the female. Um, this is one that I haven't done a whole lot of research on because I don't actually see this behavior a lot, um, except in these two species. But if you see it, that might be something you want to look up. Uh, okay, and then we're getting into this phase right now with a lot of birds uh, nest building. Um, in some species, only the female builds the nest. Uh, and we kind of learned this um, through our own anecdotal evidence and then, you know, found it in like the Birds of the World Encyclopedia online. But um, yeah, so the female, female king, Eastern kingbirds, uh, if you see them gathering nest material, um, that's a pretty good sign that it's a female. Uh, otherwise, again, visually, they're not, you know, distinguishable male, female. Um, and if you see one sitting on the nest, then it's a female. Uh, same for the boreal chickadee. Um, the male does hang around and the two, the pair will actually go house hunting together, which is super cute. Like they, they nest in cavities. So they're like poking their heads in and figuring out if the cavity is right for them. 
Um, but once they, once they find the one they want, the female starts the initial renovations. She'll start to excavate and then the male might, you know, help out a little bit. Um, but then she'll go out, look for feathers and other um, like furnishings to make the inside of the nest comfortable for the eggs and um, for the hatchlings. Um, so yeah, the female does the bulk of the work there. Uh, you might see the male hanging around, just you know, keeping a watch over things. Um, but you know, she's she's the hub of the activity when it comes to nesting. Sorry, waiting for the slide to actually advance so I don't end up wherever. <laughs> oh. Incubation. Now this is a biggie. Um, obviously hard because a lot of birds it's very actually very hard to find their nests for really good reasons because they don't want predators to find it either um but there are a number of species where only the female incubates um this is actually one thing that perbita and i and the rest of the Gal the galbatross project have noticed is that people will really um anthropomorphize birds and be like if they see birds taking care of young or sitting on the nest they must be female and as it turns out that's actually not not is it only like not true, but it's actually not typical. There are a lot of species where both sexes will incubate, will net, will build nests, will brood young. So um, it's it, it's actually can be not necessarily a challenge, but it actually is notable when you find species where um, some of those uh, what in the humans would be considered, you know, more of a female uh, uh, gender segregated uh gender segregated um uh, habits doesn't actually you know turn out with the with birds um but for the ones that do um it's actually pretty cool so um one of the ones like canada goose uh canada geese is like if you find a canada, canada goose incubating eggs it's a female it does get a little bit challenging because you have to make sure those are eggs and not young because once they hatch then uh, both sexes will actually, you know, keep the young protected um, and brood them until it's time to, you know, until they leave the nest and start foraging on their own. Uh, but if it's during egg laying season and the bird is on the nest, it's definitely a female. Uh, same with the boreal chickadee. In fact, all the chickadees um, that I've looked at so far, and I've, I, I think I've looked at all of them now, um, at least in the ABA area, uh, in, in those birds, uh, it's only the female that uh, will uh, incubate the eggs. So if you have one in like a nest box and you can like poke your head in, like it's like, all right, hey, I found a female, uh, a few found a female chickadee. Uh, same as with the great crested flycatcher and all of the flycatchers in that genus, including the ash-throated, which I know is much more of a Western bird. Um, again, only the females incubate. Canada Jay. I actually found that out today. So if you find a Canada Jay that's incubating, um, it's definitely a female. It's actually one of the only ways that you can sex those two birds, um, at least without having it in hand. Um, the one that I really love is that all of the Ampidinax flycatchers in North America uh, have this have this pattern of the female incubating eggs. So you may have no idea what species it is, but it, you can basically it's like putting Empidspa female in eBird is like the flex that I've like really taking into 2021. Um, and I'm definitely going to be looking for for that uh, down here. It's really willow flycatcher, uh, but you know, up in the boreal, a lot of least flycatchers. Um, one of the things that I learned uh, first in the literature, but then when like just talking with a bunch of uh, ecologists and ornithologists is that for cavity nesting birds later in summer, if you want to find the females, look at their tail feathers, because what happens is that their tail feathers are mashed up against the wall of the cavity and they rub there. And so female, uh, female chickadees, female flycatchers, their, their tail feathers or retrices are extremely worn. Sometimes they're bent, they look like hell. Um, and that's the way that a lot of people, a lot of uh, uh, field ecologists will actually find females is by looking at the worn retrices of the birds. That's cool. I don't know if you shared that tip with me, but now I know it. <laughs> I think I learned it like a little bit later, but then I started talking to people, some of my colleagues, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen that. That's cool. <laughs> That's too fun. 
Um, also fun, this photo, uh, I had to share it with everyone. Uh, the photographer gave us permission. He's um, out in uh, Bemidji, Minnesota. And uh, the story made headlines a few years ago. Um, this common merganser uh, female, she ended up with um, 76 chicks in her brood somehow, um, just a conglomerate of uh, adopted chicks, uh, which is amazing. But the reason I bring her up is um, a lot in a lot of waterfowl, uh, you have the female doing um, most of the caring for the young once they hatch and they get into the water. Um, and I say a lot of waterfowl, but not all waterfowl. So um, one famous example for Maine would be the common loon. Uh, both the uh, mother and father are very attentive to the chick. So um, you've probably you might have seen like a chick riding on its on the adults back uh, that could be you know either sex of of loon um, and grebes do that as well uh, both both of them will share those duties um, so yeah unfortunately we haven't really found a good a good um, way to distinguish female common loons um, so that's that's something we hope that uh, Maine birders will look out for and report back to us. This is one that's I was we I only thought about it because actually we found we found a bird we found a wren that was doing some carrying a fecal sack once and we're like huh I wonder if that's a female and it turns out no. Um, so I did a bunch of research and actually dug into the primary literature and nest sanitation. So that can be like carrying fecal sacs, that can be like taking out eggshells, picking out parasites, all of those types of nest care um, things. There's very little research on it. Um, I have found a couple of species where it seems like the females will take most or all of those duties, including the tree swallow, the evening grosbeak, and the Audubon's oriole, but it is not foolproof at all um and you know like you look at some of the papers and like the the numbers the n is like two <laughs> or like one of them was seven i was like wow that's a rich data set um so they just looked at seven nests um so this is something that is uh incomplete and interesting uh to me anyway um but this is something that not a lot of people have looked at um so i'd say if you see a bird with a fecal sac or carrying um uh, shell or whatnot, you can look at some of the, you know, look up and see if it's sex, if, the, if there might be some sex segregation, but um, this one's a really tough one, but I just wanted to tell you about it because it is there it and it could lead to, it could lead to some, to, to, to a uh, revelation, but usually not. Cool. So, yeah, this is, uh, so these are vocalizations. Uh, Prabita, I don't know if you want to tell us about them and I can play them for people. Sure. Um, so one, uh, vocalizations is a huge chapter and a huge piece of birding and identification. Um, but again, most of the songs that we're familiar with are recorded or studied from um, males. And, uh, you know, there's been this huge perception that females don't sing because, you know, they don't need to, um, they don't need to compete like that. They don't need to attract mates um, by making themselves heard. But female vocalization is probably a lot more diverse than we know. Um, and that, you know, we have little clips of um, in our uh, bird ID apps and libraries. Uh, so there are several um, experts around the world who are trying to uh, look more into this, um, but you can do your own research. So like one thing that we tried is um, the Macaulay Library, uh, which has multimedia um, free for use. Uh, you can go in and search for recordings and then filter them by female just to see what those differences are and how the females sound. Um, so here's here's a pretty you know common yellow throat that's like a very common song that you can hear um, in this season, but um, here's a sample of what the female sounds like, which is actually pretty distinct. Uh, 
Um, so the female was that kind of like quick chittering um, that we just ended on, um, which is which is really cool. Uh, so another great Oh no! <laughs> um, this beautiful new okay. kitchen tool makes it. Uh, so Blue Jays, um, another visually like visually, you cannot tell them apart. Um, the females are just as beautiful and blue as the males. Um, but they exhibit this uh, really interesting barking um, barking sound, and uh, this this clip should show that off. They are normally made while the female making the call bobs up and down. Rattle calls are used as alert calls when another jay intrudes on a pair of space. The fifth group includes. Cool. Uh, sorry, it was. Um, I shouldn't have called it a bark. It's uh, very clearly a rattle. Um, but yeah, but Blue Jays make a wide assortment of calls. But if you hear that one, that one's specific to the female. So I wanted to pull in the superb lyre bird, which couldn't be further from Rangeley, Maine or from the boreal forest. But uh, yeah, superb lyre birds, they're in Australia. And many of you have probably seen the famous David Attenborough video where um, the male is mimicking chainsaws from the forest and wrapping them into his song. Uh, but the females can also mimic um, you know, objects that they hear around them, and they'll use them uh, as like territorial calls, um, or they'll even hear hawks and then mimic those to, um, you know, keep other predators away from their nests. Uh, so there are ornithologists out in Australia who've been recording the female voices and um, trying to build this story around, you know, what, what kind of, um, how they're using sound uh, in their lives. Finally, this is a really fun one. So if you're lucky to have a um, mated pair of great horned owls around your property or at your local park, uh, you might hear them, you know, doing this uh, very classic hooting duet um, at, at dusk or at dawn. And um, you can tell wh who is who um, based on the pitch of the hoot. So the female's hoot is going to be um, slightly higher pitched than the male's. Uh, so I um, touched on this before, but they're kind of like the Galbatross project is trying to understand female bird ID from a lot of different facets. Um, there are scientists at Cornell University and um, other institutions who are doing evolutionary studies and also field work to understand how female bird um, historically how it existed. Um, it's thought that the ancestor of all birds, like the females did sing, maybe almost as profusely as males. Um, so that's why we have, there's this idea that it probably exists a lot more than, um, than we know. Uh, like one of my favorite warblers, oven birds, um, the female has six unique uh, calls of her own. Um, so yeah, it's worth it to listen for the females, um, listen to the females if you can identify them and see what new so sounds you come up with from there. Awesome. I, let's see if I can actually get this to work. Okay, so last thing that we're going to talk about um, is habitat usage. Um, this is one uh, that I think is actually really cool. Um, there are, it's, it can be really specific to the, to the bird and to the time of year. Um, 
but different sexes will habitat will will exploit the same habitat differently. Um, one of the ones I found uh, not too long ago is the American three-toed woodpecker. Uh, as it turns out, the males um, and the females will forage in completely different areas. So not only will the males like target much larger chunks, like much larger branches on the tree, um, if there's a burned patch, only the males will go in there and then the females will uh, actually stay on the margins or will be in the unburned areas. Um, it also in Quebec, it's actually the, the American three dog woodpecker has a pretty wide range and there are some geographic variations. There was one study of um, of the woodpeckers in Quebec. And as it turns out, the females always foraged higher on the tree than the males. So, uh, which I think is really cool, but this is like a thing that happens. So that's something you can notice. Um, again, so the, you know, the, these birds are dimorphic. So it doesn't mean, this isn't the only way that you're gonna be able to identify a female, but it's something that is clearly happening within that species. That's something that you can look for and just appreciate. Uh, downy woodpeckers uh, shows uh, similar, like differentiated foraging patterns, where if, um, uh, if there are males and females in the same area, then the males always go to the smaller branches and the females preferentially forage on the tree trunks. If you take the, if the, if you take the males out, then the females move to the smaller branches um, because that's for, the, for that species, that's actually the preferred foraging area. So the males will outcompete the females uh, when the, both sexes are around, but you take one away and the females will actually go and exploit the, uh, the, the preferred habitat. Uh, the last one, which I think is cool, and this is actually, again, based on um, migration timing, uh, American kestrels in the, uh, this is really in the wintering grounds in the American Southwest. Uh, the females actually, they migrate first and they occupy the prime grassland uh, hunting habitat. The males come later and they have, and they get pushed to the forest edges. So uh, when you're out there, you can see that it's like, there's gonna be all females are gonna be like, like posted up on posts and stuff, uh, you know, being able to like survey the wide grasslands, the males are gonna be hanging out near trees. And I think that's the end of our, uh, uh, of the sort of main section of this. Uh, Prabita, do you think we have time for the quiz? Yeah, I think so. Um... Yeah, I, the whole idea here is that we give you a lot of examples and we give you a lot of ideas on how to start looking at and listening for female birds differently. Um, so really, it's up to you to go into the field or to, you know, look through photographs or um, even through books and, you know, uh, put these to the test. Um, and again, you, there's always the possibility of finding new, new um, differences and nuances, which is, which is the best part. Um, yeah, so we have a little quiz. Uh, it's a big group. And again, um, we, uh, you all are muted. So it's going to be a self quiz. Um, we'll put the photos up. Um, and we just want to know, um, if it's a male or a female of the species. Um, and uh, yeah, in a few minutes, we'll share what the answers are. Uh, so you've got a red start here. Um, we did talk about this species during the presentation. Uh, it was a bit of a tricky one. Yeah, uh, Nick, Nick is right. We, you, you can put them in the chat. We can, see, we can see what folks come up with. That would be fun. Um, By the way, I apologize for like having this is not the ideal full screen here, but I'm terrified if I click on something, the whole thing's going to come crashing down. So you're stuck with my desktop. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Martha. Um, so yeah, so here's the first one. Here's number two. All right. So this is a ruby throated hummingbird. Oh, I guess if people are putting in the chat, then I shouldn't give the species. So again, male or female? Yeah, male or female. Give you a couple more seconds to look at this one. Okay. This one is not a boreal species, but we just love this. Uh, it's just a nifty little quiz photo. Yeah, so female or male. Um, this was taken in Texas, right? Um, in spring. Oh, good question. Uh, 
I don't, it was taken in spring. Yes, that's important. Um, I don't remember what state it was. Sorry, I should have noted that. Yeah, um, and the other two, the other two photos were both also from spring. And number four. All right, so we can go to the Q&A section um, or the questions. Um, if anybody has questions for us, again, I apologize for the sort of like weirdness at the very end here, um, but thank you uh, to everybody that's sat through this with us um, and hopefully had a good time uh, learning about some female bird ID. Because again, it's like very much about spending more time with an individual bird um, and noticing how it behaves and it's uh, in, and how it moves uh, much more than like ticking off species as you're like, you know, cruising through the forest, which is, again, is how, I mean, that's definitely how spring migration feels to me a lot. <laughs> it's like, all right, it's like, there's so many birds. Uh, but, you know, so sometimes it's, you know, it's just necessary to, to slow down. We do have some um, uh, materials on our website, um, femalebirdday.wordpress.com. Uh, um, and we do talk about female birds at, um, on social media, mostly Instagram and Twitter um, with the hashtag female bird day. Uh, female bird day itself happens on Memorial Day weekend every year, well, it's been for the past two years. Um, and we're going to keep on uh, doing that going forward. So uh, during that weekend, if you want to go out and look for some female birds and then tell us about it um, on social media, that would be rad. So Martha, I know you're a writer and an editor and you want to end on a cliffhanger, but we have to give the answers for the quiz. <laughs> oh yeah, no, 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 no. I just I figure we get through all of this. And oh, then okay, we'll gotcha. Project, yes. And then we can like give the answers to the quiz. That's um, true, sorry. The yeah, and I think, is, oh, yeah. sorry. Well, I think people are being a little shy with their answers. Come on, throw some yeah, answers come on. There's it no is true. Some people, some people have noted that um, only, I believe, the panelists here are able to see what the, what folks type. Oh, um, but but I'm only seeing one answer on here. Um, so uh, throw us some more. Don't be afraid. Nobody can see you. Nobody can see who is typing. So even if you're wrong, yeah. it won't matter. And I can um, go back to the. Yeah, and I can go back. Yeah, to run, the you want to run through them again? Yeah. Let me go back. So here's number one. Taken in spring. Spring 2020, in fact. Courtesy of our friend Ryan Mendelbaum. Yes, and courtesy of Ryan Mendelbaum. Here's number two. Mm. Here's number three. This is. Uh... That's a tough one. Yeah, this one, this one, this one stumped me, actually. That's why I like it. <laughs> Here's number four. The, the crazy thing about this woodpecker is that it found a found a blanket too. I don't know, I mean like <laughs> what an incredibly comfy bird. No, those are my gym <laughs> shorts. It was it was a bird. It was an injured bird that I found. Gotcha. And then I, hey, one one woman's gym shorts is another bird's blanket. <laughs> Weighted blanket. So yeah, here are the members of the Galvatross project. Um, four of us, uh, we all met at Audubon um, and four of us still work at Audubon. Hey, that was incredibly interesting. Thank you so much, um, oh, if you wanna go. So there's some resources here too. Um, you know, that was awesome. And I think you both hit it right on the head where it's easy to sort of uh, focus on getting the identification and then moving on. Um, and after a while, you know, once you're a good birder, and I know a lot of folks at the Boreal Birding Festival or, or the Rangeley Birding Festival are really good birders, uh, you know, you sort of can lose some of the excitement or you lose, you know, you think you know at all with all that stuff. But um, there's a whole other world out there of, um, of, of, you know, deeper interest and deeper knowledge and deeper understanding of um, how different species operate differently between the uh, the, the sexes and between the uh, subspecies and between the ages. There's, there's so much more to it, even if you are an expert birder. 
Um, I didn't know any of those things and I'm not an expert burger, but um, uh, uh, you know, most of those things I had never heard of before and I will keep an eye out for. So thank you so much. Um, that, was, that was really, really interesting. Um, let's try to cover the quiz answers real quick. And let me say, um, uh, please, if you have questions uh, for Martha or Pravita, please uh, put them in the Q&A box down below, uh, put them in there. We'll go through the answers from the quiz first. And then um, we will uh, move on to questions. So um, maybe Martha, if you feel comfortable, you want to throw that back up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that. Uh, just a moment. Let's do it. And we did get a few more chats this time. So thank you uh, to those of you who submitted your questions. And we got All right, so. quite a few compliments for you too also, which you should know. So here we go, number one. Martha, you can do this one because I know you love it. Yeah, I know I'm like such a fan of the uh, of the American red start trick bird. So this, in fact, is a male. Uh, again, this is a first year male um, or a, an immature male. Uh, what happens with red starts and a lot of warblers is that they start that you have the that the young males have uh, plumage just like the females all the way through until their first basically not the summer they were born, but the first summer that they're back up in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, if you look very closely again, um, but at the eye and but so in the laurel area, so that's between the eye and the bill, um, there are some black feathers that are coming in here. And there's actually one tiny black feather you can see coming in oh. in, the, in, the, in that area as well. This is one that I didn't know. And then it was like, our, it was actually our colleague, Stephanie Bilkey, like looked at this like, no, that's actually a really young male that's just starting to molt. So I was like, that's hmm. when I like really like fell in love with, with uh, young male American red starts and females, because then it became like, this spring in particular, I was looking for, I, I looked at every red start, every, mm -hmm. every gray red start, I looked at very, very closely. And I found, uh, I was probably 50, it was probably 50, 50 actually of like, of uh, immature male versus mm -hmm. female. So that was, uh, I learned something and it like, again, changed the way I birded uh, the following spring. And that's a tough one for me sometimes, because I think sometimes those black feathers in front of the eye can look like shadow, you know, I think yes. right here, it, it kind of, you know, um, if you told me that was a shadow, I would also buy that. So yeah, um, that's a good exactly. one to keep in mind and look carefully. Yeah. For. One of the things I've learned that it's like, you know, when you talk with a lot of different birders um, and you start sharing photos, photo ID is not all that is cut, that is cut out to be. It is very, very hard to look at subtleties um, with photos because you're really missing um, a lot of the, the contextual information. Uh, so I found that it's, uh, that it, that just photos by themselves can be very tricky. So here's number two. Yeah, I like this one. Um, so similar to the red start, this ruby throated and hummingbird comes down to one feather. Um, and it is that red feather in the gorget or, um, the kind of neck chin area. So that should be your indicator that it's a young male, um, ruby throated hummingbird. Yeah, so, I, oh, go ahead. I was say you can see a little bit of the cinnamon color down here That's as true. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this. It's a great photo. Awesome. Ha <laughs> ha. This one. Ha <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah. So this one. Uh, First of all, the I, I don't even know if I could ID this species um, in, in the field. It's a tough one, but it is a painted bunting. Uh, and the um, immature male and the female look so similar. It's very hard. Um, and as you might know, like the adult male is just worlds different um, in terms of colors. So the key here was um, looking at what the bird is doing and it's kind of it's sitting at the top of a tree and it's just belting its heart out. Um, so that was kind of the hint that this is probably a young male who um, was singing the typical um, painted bunting song uh, and you know trying to serenade a female. Um, yeah, I got this one wrong. I thought for sure it was a uh, female pented bunting. And then it that was is a tough one. 
yeah then it's like oh yeah singing wow and you know if you've seen female buntings in the wild they tend to hang out more in the understory they don't sit at the top of bushes they're because yeah. they don't want to get picked off by a hawk mm. so they like actually hang out middle in the middle of the canopy or under shrubs um, and a lot of species do that a lot of uh um a lot of the grassland species the males the bobolinks or red or the red-winged blackbirds they hang out on the top of the grass and then the females hang you know about a foot and a half two feet down into the grass so it's hmm. like you have to look at the basically um where they are spatially in their uh in their space and just to say that's another one where photo id can be tough because maybe it's uh that bird was yawning or burping or it was yep. laughing at a yeah. joke it or, <laughs> earlier cool cool dad jokes next <laughs> <laughs> gotta go bye <laughs> <laughs> um okay and then the last one uh like i said this was a bird that i picked up on the side of the road because it needed rehab attention um it is a pileated woodpecker and first you can tell the age of the bird well i mean like not to the exact date but um you can tell it's a young bird because that red um trademark pileated woodpecker crest hasn't fully grown in um in terms of sex uh i'm pretty sure it was a female um because in adult males um they have the red malar stripe um or again the mustache uh, and it does start to show up in the young males too. And in this in this bird, that stripe is purely black. Um, there's a little bit of reddish like on its face, but that's like uniform, I think, across juveniles. So uh, yeah, I I'm pretty certain this is a young female. Right on, we did it. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. Uh, if you have more questions, please uh, put them in. We had some questions for uh, about who the, what the answers were. Everyone is <laughs> showering with thanks. Um, I also want to thank you two so very much for joining us. Um, this was outstanding. Um, for folks who are tuning in, and I, so it's we're over time, so I think we should probably um, go enjoy our Saturday evenings. Um, next year, sign up for the Rangy Birding Festival. Come on up. It's beautiful. The weather is outstanding. There are birds. You have to you have to swat them out of the way. You can't even like leave your house without uh, seeing birds up there. So uh, please sign up for the Rangeley uh, Birding Festival next year. Probably be the same weekend uh, in 2022. Um, I truly want to offer my thanks to uh, Perbita and Martha for joining us tonight. This was outstanding. Thanks for taking your Saturday night with us. Thank you everyone watching, uh, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.